Hello everyone and welcome to the Old Fashioned Health Network. Good health inside and out. I'm Gwen McDaniel, your host for the Senior Living Show and our guest today is Mr. William Murray with the Murray Brothers Funeral Home Services here in Atlanta. And you know, Mr. Murray, you are in a very unique but kind of mysterious business. True. And oftentimes people don't know much about what you offer. So today we're going to have a good discussion about the awesome services that you uh, provide for our community. So welcome. I'm extremely excited to have you with us today. Same here. Great. So, you know, when I was growing up in Mississippi, one of the things about funeral homes is we never got too close to the, the people there. We didn't go up much because we just felt it was kind of dark and mysterious. And nowadays your place is beautiful. It's light, it's warming. Your services are so different now. But because you do offer such unique services uh, to the community, we want to talk a little bit about what those services look like. So before we do that, tell me a little bit about Murray Brothers. When you got started, um, how many uh, service locations you have? And um, so we can get to know a little bit more about what you do. Murray Brothers Funeral Home uh, has two founders, um, Hubert L. Murray and William G. Murray. Mm -hmm. The Murray Brothers uh, brand was founded uh, in the back of a funeral home called Gus Thornhill, which is located in East Point, Georgia. The simple question was asked, Bill, my father, from my uncle Huber, do you think you can handle this? And my father replied, yes. And our first location was at 195 Sonoya Road, which was a building that had burned down uh, with a fire, um, by fire. And uh, a uncle, Kenneth Murray, who is now the CEO of Murray Brothers Funeral Home, rendered a plan uh, and uh, blueprints of what the building should look like. A older brother named Thomas Murray, along with my father, uh, Bill, uh, William Murray, a cousin, Ronald Murray, another cousin, Tony Murray, and yours truly, built the funeral home in Fairburn, Georgia, actually restored the building and brought it up um, to where we were able to open in 1981. How about that? So, 81, that means it's about 36 years. Correct. Which is probably as old as you are. <laughs> so, you've <laughs> Thank grown you. up in this business. And that's extremely important when it comes to the legacy that families provide. But when we look at funeral services, um, I think oftentimes about long-term illnesses. About eight years ago, I experienced my husband having a long-term illness from cancer. And after 18 months, then we had to make the decisions on what we would do after he transitioned on. What recommendations um, would you make to families when there is a situation of a long-term illness and you know that things are about to happen? What would you recommend families do? Uh, the first thing you want to do is to have that discussion about the elephant in the room, which is death. Mm -hmm. And you want to sit down with your uh, spouse or your mother or father, whoever this person is, and go through it verbatimly on what needs to take place. There are a lot of things that come into play, such as um, monies in the banking account, um, housing, um, the um, maximizing of all of the benefits that a person can have um, in the transition, mm -hmm. I should say. Um, what some people do is they pick the most responsible person around them and then from there they will make them power of attorney. After making them power of attorney, um, in order to receive some of the maximum benefits from um, Medicaid and Medicare, um, you have to have certain funds out of the banking accounts so that if a person has to go into hospice um, or any type of facility um, that they can be taken um, without um, 
any problems. Mm -hmm. um, also, what the facility wants to see is what did you do with those funds? And by setting up a prearrangement with a funeral home, that is an excuse that you can use to, um, um, instead of just liquidating, and then there's no uh, f um, place where the funds absolutely went. Mm -hmm. um, that is an excuse that you can use, a legal excuse, by saying, well, we set up there, we purchased a funeral, as well as plots for mom, and that's what happened to whatever the funds were mm -hmm. um, in the bank. And you know, when you think of long-term illnesses, um, that we oftentimes realize that if people prepare ahead of time, there are certain things that you can do to keep the, so much emotion out of it. it it's tough either way. But um, for me and with my husband, we made arrangements with the funeral home. We selected it. Mm -hmm. So when people decide that they need to make selections, how do you make that selection? How do you distinguish between one funeral home and another, what would you say is one of the major things that you need to look at when you're going through this? Well, um, the funeral home business is one of the, the most oddest businesses uh, there is in history. And majority of the business from the funeral home doesn't come from advertising, it doesn't come from um, uh, being out in the community, but it comes from word and word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And when um, you take care of a family during their most trying time, um, then it is easy for them to recommend you to someone else. Right. So the uh, Murray Brothers is not one of the funeral homes that constantly advertises, advertises, advertises. But what we do is we go from our past history and that's how we've been able to grow the business because mm -hmm. sometimes you can put out there um, a lot of advertisement that'll bring you a lot of business um, that you're not ready for. Um, and then at the same time, you have to look at your targeted our audience as well. Good. So how important is it that um, they recognize insurance if it's available, um, that they consider uh, other things that need to take them through this process, um, even to the gravesite. Well, uh, in dealing with uh, death, um, when you're dealing with death, a long-term um, death of, that may be occurring, the best thing to do uh, with that is, if the person does not have insurance, that is not the time to go out and get insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, nine times out of ten, if the person passes within two years, the insurance policy is contestable. Um, they're going to look at the pre-existing conditions uh, within those two years, um, should the person pass in those two years, and they're going to um, look at the metal, uh, medical history and when they determined that the person was sick before the insurance policy and they had had this treatment during those two years, then what they will do is send the family back the premium. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people make the misconception of getting insurance and thinking that you're covered right away. Um, in a sense, the insurance company is telling you that, so you say they are covered, but it has to be an act of God um, other accident than this, yeah, accident um, uh, in order for that to pay off. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So they need to make sure at that point that if there is insurance in place, they know where it is, they know Correct. where the bank account uh, information is, all of that personal stuff that sometimes, you know, we don't want to ask family members, but we actually get to this point where we really have to find out. You know, where is everything? Right. Um, and who we need to talk to, um, family members needing to be involved, all of those mm -hmm. things. Now, it's a little bit different when we go, when we are living in a situation and there's an accident. Correct. All of the things that we've talked about need to be done when there's a long term illness. Correct. But when there is an immediate death, some other things need to take place. And to keep from getting so emotionally involved where we may spend more money than we have or mm -hmm. we may do some things we would not ordinarily do. 
We'll come back after break and we'll talk about some of the differences between those two situations. Okay. And see if we can help our, our um, audience out with that. Okay? okay? We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back everyone uh, to the Old Fashioned Health Network. We have been talking about issues surrounding funeral home services and we were talking about long-term illness uh, before the break, Mr. Uh, Mr. Murray. And now let's entertain uh, some of the immediate things that need to be done when someone dies immediately. You know, there's a different sense of urgency, uh, some different things occur. Let's walk the families through the process of what's needed. You know, when you look at the consultation and those kind of things, what are some of the services that you provide at that point? At that point in time, once death takes place, uh, if the family has to <clears throat> recognize a couple of things, are they prepared for the death? Or is this a situation where we're not prepared? If you're prepared, you consider to have insurance, uh, a means to bury a loved one, or uh, provide cremation services. Uh, so that's kind of like uh, the easy street. Mm -hmm. The hard street is when someone is not prepared and in a, mo a matter of minutes, you have to determine which funeral home that you would like to use. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest to that person who is not prepared is to simply pick up the phone and call at least three to four funeral homes. If a funeral home can't answer verbatimly um, the information that you need, such as, do you offer a bundle? Do you um, have cemetery prices? And if that's um, within your means, then you should be able to select the funeral home of your choice. Because a lot of people recommend funeral homes but at the same time, <clears throat> when they do the recommending of the funeral homes, um, it is uh, with different circumstances. Mm -hmm. That person might have been prepared. So this funeral home doesn't offer a um, financing option or they don't offer a um, uh, some payment plan, right? basically. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to take all of that into the equation. And I would say um, with, uh, since 2010, a lot of families are not prepared. And then my generation is not like the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. The baby boomers were taught how to be prepared, how to carry out different things, and then pass it on to the next generation. Whereas my generation, is um, they get caught up in a lot of stuff that really is totally irrelevant to mm -hmm. being a productive citizen in the United States. Mm -hmm. So when they make that decision, um, different um, things such as insurance um, and then setting things up for the next generation is not a major concern. So how <clears throat> does things like Social Security or Veterans Administration how, what role does that play at this time? Well, Social Security offers a death benefit of two hundred and twenty-five dollars um, that goes to the spouse or to the child or children that are under eighteen. Mm -hmm. And of course, if the uh, parent had been working um, and um, was a part of the workforce, then the child could receive benefits from Social Security up until age eighteen. Um, with the Veterans Administration, the Veterans Administration, they offer, if you are a veteran and you have um, been discharged um, from the uh, military honorably, then you are entitled to a grave, headstone, uh, vault, or if you choose cremation, um, a columbarium. Um, and that is located in one place, which is um, in the state of Georgia, which is Canton Veterans Memorial Cemetery, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is sometimes called Georgia National. Mm -hmm. Other cemeteries offer a free space for a veteran, but they will charge you for the opening and closing. They will charge you for the vault, even though the headstone comes from 
the um, United States government, you still have to purchase the granite piece, which goes under that headstone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once you purchase that, then they charge you for installing that. A lot of people get confused yeah. in thinking that it's free at uh, different cemeteries. Well, you know, what's interesting is that you have an opportunity to educate families. Even though this happens and it's a shock, um, they don't know where to turn. So the benefit of your services is that you have someone here that can help walk them through that process. Well, you've done uh, a great job in educating us on some of the things that we need to think about, but I love the fact now that you are really ingrained into the community. This is truly a relationship business. It is. And um, we have to feel comfortable coming to you asking questions. And I'm glad to see that you are in a position to where as a young one, you can go out and share this education with the community so that it does in time prep us um, a whole lot better in knowing how to prepare for this transition because we all got to go there. Yes, We all <laughs> got to go there. And we definitely want to make sure that we do it to the best of our ability so that it benefits everyone. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We uh, hope that the information that we share with you is beneficial. And thank you so much, uh, yes, Ms. Murr, for, for uh, working with us today and providing this information to our audience. Have a great week.